Hi und herzlich willkommen bei Studio Bonn, dem Think Tank der Bundeskunsthalle. Ich bin Kolja Reichert, Kurator für das Kurs an der Bundeskunsthalle und ich habe keine Kontrolle darüber, was heute Abend passiert. Und auch mein Chef, der Geschäftsführer der Bundeskunsthalle, Oliver Hölken, kann nicht kontrollieren, was heute Abend passiert. Das liegt in Ihrer Hand, liebe Zuschauerinnen, Zuschauer, Zuschauerinnen, hier im Saal und zu Hause vor den Bildschirmen. Heute Abend geht es um nicht weniger als um die Zukunft der Bundeskunsthalle. Und über diese Zukunft können Sie alle im Lauf dieser Sendung abstimmen. Ja, Sie wundern sich vielleicht, warum die Bühne hier so voll ist, warum hier so viele Menschen sitzen. Das liegt daran, dass die Bundeskunsthalle besetzt ist. Sie wurde besetzt im letzten Jahr bei Studio Bonn im Themenzyklus Tauschwerte, als schon einmal die Künstlerin Hito Steyerl zu Gast war. Ich möchte herzlich die BesetzerInnen und Besetzer oh, und Besetzerinnen I would now like to cordially welcome the squatters of the Bundeskunsthalle. Uh, on the other side, other, inter Shorin, other internet, Sam represented Hart, by Toby Shorin, Sam Hart and Laura Lotti. Let's give them a warm applause. Im Zentrum And at the center, the Department of Decentralization, represented by Stina Gustafsson, Maria Paula Fernandez, and Beth McCarthy. Welcome. They all came from Berlin today, which is a center of the crypto or blockchain avant-garde, together with the artist and essayist uh, Hito Steil, who is also a professor at the Berlin Academy of the Arts. I've admired her for a long time, and tonight, together with us, she will be producing a new work with all of us. So, Hito, tell me, why did you squat the art exhibition hall what did you do and how to be honest so let me just switch the tone now and also switch the language so my guests are able our guests are able to understand what i'm going to do now so basically the aim of tonight's experiment is something very very modest and maybe not even particularly successful, but I think it asks a very important question, namely the question of institutional transformation, the question of who is owning the public sphere right now, and especially public art institutions. And we are suggesting, all of us together, I think, and I'd really like to ask my collaborators and guests, I'd really like to thank them for almost a year of very productive um, preparation for this event. We will try to uh, launch a small experiment in public governance of an art institution tonight. I want to add that this experiment was basically devised last year. We were supposed to present it in December already, and it's March now, and basically we are in a situation where I also have to ask myself, what, what is the meaning of doing such a thing, you know, when there is a full-scale attack by the Russian army on the, Ukraini on, on the Ukrainian nation going on right now. What are these kinds of abstract experiments even going to do in such a situation? So also I myself and I think all of us somehow found ourselves uh, overwhelmed by this situation. But still, I think there is some value in conducting this kind of experiment, even now and even if the value is modest. Because, as I said, the question is really, why is institutional transformation necessary even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and beyond the current crisis? And Shota, who does the public sphere really belong to? And this is not a theoretical problem, but one which has also affected this very institution which we are sitting in right now, 
um, as well. It's not like we didn't have large-scale structural problems in legacy art institutions which cause the hollowing out of the public sphere, public institutions, through the increased influence of donors and sponsors and oligarch-operated shell companies and so on of all kinds, which bring in their own interests. So this institution here had serious problems in terms of financial accountability between 1999 and 2006, and then again mixing up private and public interest in 2012 when an Anselm Kiefer show seemed to benefit only the private collection it was being sourced from through a cultural manager called Walter Schmerling. The Kiefer shows co consisted solely of works from this private collection, thus, of course, raising its value. It was pledged to a public museum, which is actually across the courtyard, and it ended up in someone else's private museum in some kind of major clusterfuck. And you might think, who cares? You know, I mean, I'm not a Kiefer collector. Why should I care? I don't think there is too many people in the world who would um, care about, you know, speculations in the Kiefer market. But in fact, this very person surfaced again very recently organizing a big show called Diversity United, which ended up being pa patroned, maybe this is a word, patroned by none other than Vladimir Putin when it traveled to Moscow recently, thus basically art washing and providing the Russian autocracy with some sort of, you know, cultural decoration, um, so to speak. So as you can see, public institutions are under threat of being instrumentalized by, in this case, an industrial and political network profiting from the German-Russian extractivist Nord Stream cluster, which is very much involved also in the current invasion, in the current war. This is also why, instead of any art tonight, we have put on calls for donations for different entities which are involved in the relief effort for Ukraine and also uh, in the crypto case, which I think DOD will explain in a minute, uh, for Ukraine, the Ukraine basically itself. But I think you will talk about this in a minute. There's also another reason why I think it's important to, to talk about institutional transformation tonight and also how to react to this crisis, because there is a sort of reflex by Western cultural institutions to react to any sort of crisis, which is basically to transform it into some kind of humanitarian spectacle. We were uh, talking to our colleague Nikita Kadan, who is currently in Kiev, and he said he expects, you know, Western art institutions to react with what he calls we transfer exhibitions. You know, Ukrainian artists send files to Western institutions and they put on some kind of exhibitions while the conditions of production are not only precarious but still dangerous, and while also this kind of activity almost prevents the institutions taking responsibility for their own implications in the causes of such crisis. It is telling, I think, that almost any industry has some sort of ethical guidelines compliance rules, so to speak, some kind of regulations, what they are able to do, what kind of donations to accept, what kind of investments to be cool with and not, and which ones not. But the art world basically doesn't have any of these. It has barely any sort of ethical guidelines, let alone compliance rules. And I think in order not to always, you know, be uh, running after each crisis and getting into the same uh, spectacle circle again, the art world should start to think about rules of accountability, of transparency, and of ethical conduct. And I think that our experiment might be a small step in at least initiating this discussion, which comes always too late. In every crisis, this is being raised and mentioned as a topic, but it's never done.
So in these two senses, I think that even if what we are going to do tonight is a peacetime experiment, it is modest and probably not even very successful, I think it should be uh, mod modestly useful in trying to at least start thinking about the question of who owns the public sphere in a kind of serious sense. So what we are going to do is basically just a test and in this test, we want to consider infrastructure. What is the infrastructure of a public art institution? And we also wanted to test the claims of blockchain technology, and I think my collaborators can say a lot about that later, to be able to provide tools for transparency and participatory governance um, for art institutions. So we wanted to see, are these tools really able to address problems such as gatekeepership, uh, financial intransparency, and so on, and so on. And can we really create better tools of governance for art institutions using this type of technology? And full disclaimer, we are not using it tonight. We're using some sort of blockchain simulation. It's not, uh, it's basically a, a mock-up. Uh, let me tell you about the backstory for this event tonight. Almost a year ago, with my colleagues from the Department of Decentralization, I minted a number of art institutions as NFTs. And this was done in a very old-fashioned way, which is called squatting. Squatting an internet address, so to speak. Uh, squatting a domain. So the thing we squatted by minting it as an NFT was this institution's Ethereum address. Now, this is very technical. You don't really have to understand it. Just imagine it as some sort of magic spell. I will put a magic spell on, let's say, this institution. I call it an NFT, and by this kind of magic of property, it somehow becomes mine. And I was trying to invoke this magic in order to really ask the question, what kind of property does an NFT confer? Maybe none at all. Maybe it's just, uh, you know, some kind of registry. And if it is, what does this really mean? And so on. Does it mean that if I own the NFT to this institution, does it mean that I own this room, this house, these walls, and so on? Of course not. But we thought that uh, we could still use this sort of virtual magical entity called the Virtual Bundeskunsthalle to launch an experiment to test these blockchain procedures and protocols to see can we, can we suggest some models of participatory governance of these institutions which in fact would make sense. So. Uh, let me just briefly introduce my collaborators now because I couldn't have done it without them. I mean, this is not a contest of three teams against one another. This has been and is still a collaborative experiment in learning and experimenting together. Let me first um, uh, introduce my colleagues from the Department of Decentralizations, which are describing themselves as a collective of individuals who are working on decentralized open source and the intersections between such technologies and arts, discussing both the benefits and challenges of decentralization open source software. And from the beginning, they have worked a lot on raising these questions also in the context of art. They have a long-standing connection to um, trying to think through these questions in the art sphere. And they also developed the voting tool for this evening with Tim Daubenschütz, who thankfully traveled here, mm -hmm. and Lea Filippo, and uh, this is Maria Paula Fernandez. In the middle, Stinov Gustafsson on your left, and uh, Bess McCarthy on your right, and everyone traveled today from Berlin. And over there, there is the other internet, uh, represented by Toby Shorin, Sam Hart, and Laura Lotti, and they describe their organization as an applied research research organization who study and build social technology and advise organizations on decentralized coordinations. So let me just uh, explain the setup of this experiment and stress again that these are 
uh, not anything that's going to help in the short term. That's a more fundamental discussion. So what we are going to do, and now we would like to switch to the BIMA, um, is to go to a website which is called strikedow.com. We are waiting now to see it come up on the screen, but in the space you can already go to this website, strikedow.com. Frank, hörst du mich? And you will see, ah, now, okay, now we see the screen here on our big screen, you will land on this web page, right? You see it. And here uh, you will hit basically the participate button to sign up with your email address, which obviously we are not going to store, is really everything will be deleted after this experiment. And if you fill this with a functional email address and hit this button, send me an email, an email will be sent to you. Um, and while you are going through this process, I want just to stress a couple of things, which is, as I said, we are not using any sort of existing blockchain for this experiment because also just the environmental externalities would be way too, uh, too, too serious to consider for such kind of experiments, so we are not trying to cause any sort of superfluous CO2 emissions caused by blockchain uh, registration processes called proof-of-work protocol. So we are not doing this. This is a simulation, right? And um, we are also not doing this because, you know, the, the fees would be kind of um, incongruent in relation to this experiment. Um, and there are also other takeaways, which I will tell you about right now while you're still signing up, is that in a way I discovered that if you work with blockchain, it's best to take out the blockchain for now. It's just, it's just not really useful. You, you just don't do it. Block, all blockchain, fine, without the blockchain. And also, don't use, use as little technology as possible. So that's, I think, a very... Uh, important takeaway which we can discuss later. So I think that probably you did get an email. Uh, I see some people nodding in the audience, meaning that if you hit, basically, I'm going to open my email here, there is a button here which says vote now. And if you hit it, you will end on this page here. And um, you will be able to vote for three different proposals on how to run, run Bundeskunsthalle or the virtual domain of Bundeskunsthalle um, going forward. And there is, um, it's, it, there is a, let's say, blockchain-oriented or inspired procedure for voting, which is called quadratic voting, which means that each of you has 25 voting credits in their device. And you are able to distribute them to the different, three different proposals, right? You don't have to vote just for one. You can say, I will give 40% of my vote to proposal number one, and 20% to number two, and the other 20% to the third one. That's also possible. And this is a procedure called quadratic voting. Um, which, yeah, which can be seen, just a second, on this slide here. So basically, if you, uh, if you cast one vote, it, it will basically, you will use one voting credit, but two votes will basically cost you four voting credits, three votes will cost you nine voting credits, and so on. So basically, in this way, you will be able to distribute your votes to the three um, proposals, and the teams will present those proposals to you in a minute, but, you know, I mean, just to show you how it's being done, so, for example, I cast three votes here, I have 16 voting credits left, and then I can cast some other ones here, and I have 12 left, and I'm going to give them to the third, um, third proposal, and then I can say vote. And you can also vote if you don't spend all your credits. And we will show you the result of the vote 
later, the result will be a bit, um, let's say, different from other voting results. It will result in a re-editing of one of my films. So basically, the still in this video work will be rearranged according to the votes that are being cast. So in a way, it's a sort of participatory montage process which you are also being involved. And we will show you the results of the vote in form of this reorganized and re-edited film later. Uh, but first of all, of course, I think you need to hear the proposals first of how to run Bundeskunsthalle in the future. And this is why I would like to invite the teams to the stage. First, the team by Bundeskunsthalle, comprised of the CEO, Oliver Hölken and Kolja Reichelt. Then secondly, the team of um, Department of Decentralization. And then thirdly, the team of other internet. And then we will reconvene to basically discuss the procedure and also to get questions, I think, from the audience, maybe, and then also to show you the results later on. Thank you. Thank you, Hito. Uh, Thank you, Hito. Um, let me add to this, if you have a problem with all these technical terms and if you want to look up what blockchain technology really is and what you can do with it, at Studio Bonn, at our website, we have created a little glossary with the uh, key terms and explanations. And also the results of tonight, um, the, the resulting artwork will be purchased by the Federal Republic of Germany and will be showcased in May uh, in a series of new uh, works of art that uh, will be purchased by the Federal Republic of Germany. So. Let's hear the first presentation. Well, good evening to all of you and also to our international guests. I'm uh, very pleased that I have a chance tonight to be part of this experiment. However, I am in charge of the part to uh, describe the status quo of uh, the governance of the um, Bundeskunsthalle. The Bundeskunsthalle, der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, GmbH, that's the official term, but in short, it's the Bundeskunsthalle. It's a privately organized company, like uh, in the private sector, organized as a limited liability company. However, and that's a special feature, it is owned by the government. It is publicly owned. So 61% of the shares of the company are owned by the Federal Republic of Germany, and 2.5% are owned by the individual federal states. So these figures are rounded uh, because the sum total is 101 percent, but um, we rounded off the figures a little bit. Now the special feature about this is that culture in general in the Federal Republic of Germany is not a government function of the federal government, but culture is something that is governed by the individual federal states. In 1992, when this um, exhibition hall was opened, this was the special, the specialty, the special new feature that for the first time the Federal Republic of Germany entered the art market and created a representative uh, art gallery, if you will, um, to showcase the um, cultural artworks owned by the federal government. And uh, this goes back to an initiative that was launched by the then Chancellor, Federal Chancellor Helmut Kohl. So it was opened in 1992. So this year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. And so this is my sales pitch here. Um, I'd like to in invite you also in, in the summer when we will celebrate this 30th anniversary and we will have a big party. We have 5,600 square meters of exhibition space, five to eight major shows every year ranging from art and culture to archaeology, everything you can imagine. We don't have our own collection, and maybe that's another special feature, so we are not really a museum. So 
we we work like a museum, but we don't have a museum collection. And usually we have 400,000 visitors that is outside COVID, uh, a period where COVID hits. And we do smaller uh, shows and bigger shows. And we also do uh, a number of events like Studio Bonn, but also conferences, art performances, dance, dancing. Um, these are some examples of um, our events. Now, if you wonder how we organize this institution, uh, this is getting a little more complex. So, as I said, we are organized like a private sector company, if you will, but we are owned by the government. And that's the reason why there is a complex structure that um, really governs this institution. Let's start at the top, the federal chancellery and the federal chancellor at the top of this structure and he has a state secretary Claudia Roth she is the federal commissioner for the arts and culture BKM these are the representatives of the federal uh, republic in our institution they send five people into our board of trustees uh, which is something like a supervisory board in the private sector. The state government sent four delegates to the Board of Trustees, so the entire Board of Trustees is made up of nine people. These nine people monitor and supervise the operations of the Bundeskunsthalle, like a supervisory board would do this. And they also have a program council, and in the program council you will find people from the European arts scene who advise the Bundeskunsthalle. So, and this brings us to the, to the question, how does the whole thing work? Now, public control, I think, was mentioned before, uh, public monitoring. How does this happen? So what happens if an, or whenever an exhibition is launched? Who has the first idea for an exhibition? And how is it implemented? It could be an idea of an individual trustee. Uh, could be an idea of our general manager. Um, so our general manager is, is sick right now and uh, hope she gets better soon. Um, or it could be the idea for a particular show that could come from the program council. So the, the first spark or the first trigger can come from different sources. So the board of trustees, along with the general manager, will evaluate these ideas and they take an, take an initial decision on how this idea could be implemented. Then you have a first project plan an implementation plan. But before you can address this, there's another process that you need to take into account, and that is the public sector uh, that needs to be involved. So first of all, the program is considered with the uh, program council, the people from the arts and culture scene. They can, they will evaluate the, the plan, and they also decide the annual program. And before you can start implementing um, an a show, for example, you have to go back to the Board of Trustees and that Board of Trustees will also determine the program for the next one to two years. So we cannot do whatever you know comes into our mind, but we have to get the approval of these bodies. And the same applies to our budget, and that's no secret. The Bundeskunsthalle is not a for-profit company. We're not supposed to generate a profit. On the on the contrary, uh, we cost money. Whatever we do costs money and we spend uh, tax payers' money. And that's something that we need to take into account. While we are organized as a limited liability company, um, we have to follow all the rules that apply to a private sector company. Uh, we have to do our annual accounts. We are audited um, also by the tax authorities, by the social insurances. 
However, since we get taxpayers' money, we are also linked to the federal government structure. We are also audited by the Federal Administrative uh, Authority and the Federal Court of Auditors to make sure that we don't waste public funding. The Bundeskunsthalle itself, and now it gets even more confusing, is a company, as I said, and it's organized like a company. So this is our organizational chart, and you'll find that on our homepage as well. We have very just regular departments uh, like other companies have, financial accounting, IT, legal a department, for example. Uh, we also have a uh, procurement or purchasing department and uh, awarding contracts. We have to organize tenders for contracts and in some cases even uh, these are Europe-wide tenders. Um, we have the visitor service that looks after our, you know, visitors to our shows. Um, so guards, uh, security services, marketing, we've got um, implementation of shows, um, they set up exhibitions, we have museum education, we have program department, these are our trustees who develop the ideas for our exhibitions and shows, and then some staff functions, uh, press uh, spokesmen, um, health and safety officers. So, 110 full-time employees as a total, plus a number of freelance people, people who do the uh, guided tours here, who offer certain education programs. We also have a subsidiary. They uh, look after security here, 50 people uh, who work for this institution. So it's a huge container, a huge tanker. Um, that we need to get organized, but I mean, art is really what's uh, the most important thing, is the key thing that everything else revolves around. And this brings me to the end of my uh, little presentation. This is how we are organized. And of course, I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. We'll have a Q&A after the presentations. We can see that the blockchain technology is uh, complicated, but representative democracy and its institutions are very complicated as well. And as part of uh, our uh, conferences on exchange values, we are also talking about blockchain technology and what it means for the cultural and governmental sphere. The blockchain basically is an accounting tool and an admin tool. It's a technology that promises that institutions such as ours um, are not really needed, but, but that you can set up all sorts of coordination processes and money transactions individually um, between individuals without institutions such as ours. And now I am very much looking forward to the presentation of a, well, reinvented Bundeskunsthalle. Um, these are the experts on decentralization. You'll be talking about the risks and opportunities, the Department of Decentralization. Let's give them a warm round of applause. need some technical help you know technical people don't know really know how to run computers <laughs> so um, the presentation it's called exchange values right Is that yeah one? oh okay that no oh, no 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 that no that's um Bundesgonzale. Cool. Thank you very much for the technical help. I know I should be uh, 
able to sort these things out, but I work on research, so I don't really know anything about implementation. Um, so my name is Maria Paula Fernandez, and with Beth and Stina here, um, we run the Department of Decentralization. We started in 2018 in Berlin as a think tank, or, uh, originally, we organized events where we tried to get together the cultural scene from Berlin and the hacker culture that we were bringing from all around the world and seeing what happens in the span of a couple of days. Um, of course, with the pandemic, uh, the events were no longer possible. Oh, it's not working. We need the slides on screen, please. Oh, yes. Yep. We apologize. Danke. Oh, it was the title. Danke. No worries. Danke. No one cares about that. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, with the pandemic, it was no longer possible for us to do our uh, real life experiments. So we uh, got deeper into researching and that's how we got here. Um, our main assumption for this proposal is that there's no such thing as this intermediation. And, uh, you know, the main premise that everyone's trying to sell about on-chain governance is that it can be completely horizontal and transparent and inclusive, but uh, that rarely happens. Um, so what we're trying to do here with our presentation is creating a more transparent system that's able to adapt and to merge with, the, with that of the Bundeskunsthalle. We're not trying to replace or disrupt or any of the buzzwords that blockchain people used to tell you. Uh, we're just trying to, you know, create better systems and more inclusion. So, Beth? <laughs> oh. So, yeah, just before we go into our presentation, we just wanted to show this uh, diagram again, reinstating how the Bundeskunsthalle is currently organized. Um. Yeah, so um, as you can see in the, um, their organogram, off-chain governance structures uh, share many of the challenges in adaptation and resiliency as on-chain governance. Off-chain governance structures and their core elements can be uh, configured to execute on-chain, which MP will describe uh, more in depth shortly. Um, the key difference between on- and off-chain governance lies in the fact that any decision made on-chain is permanently inscribed on the blockchain, making it immutable and irreversible. This can lead to unintended consequences in chaotic governance infrastructures and voting processes as organizations grow and become more complex. A key example came last year from decentralized finance tool SushiSwap, um, which took a widely publicized failure as an opportunity to set an example for the community about how these problems arise and can be identified and restructured to align with the gov uh, organization's tools and intentions. I mean, goals. <laughs> um, a key learning from Sushi Swap was um, in what Joe Freeman characterizes the tyranny of structurelessness, where ambiguously defined hierarchies and processes leave a, vac a vacuum for uh, tumultuous power dynamics to emerge. Um, one solution is to identify points in which expert and uh, expert input and hierarchical sign-off are required for optimal use of shared resources, such as making decisions about hiring software engineers or, um, you know, bringing in experts in certain types of art. <laughs> um, so uh, we propose, um, as has kind of been stated before, not a complete overhaul, um, but a fork of two different things. So um, a reimagining of the Bundeskunsthal um, structure that uh, also makes way for this on-chain element and also um, using an existing on-chain system that already functions effectively um, while leaving space for incorporating learning such as from SushiSwap. Okay, cool. Um, so our alternative proposal for the governance of Bundeskunsthalle is a model uh, after uh, the governance structure from a technology that's called Polkadot. Polkadot is in essence an internet of blockchain and it's very heavy on on-chain governance. Why did we pick this one? Because it works. It works. Uh, you know, you get the proposals uh, out, you get them voted, they get funded, so this is an effective one. It seems and it is very very structured, it is tiered as well, it has specialized councils, it has a technical committee, it has a council, and it also has a very complex way of, uh, you know, establishing which proposal uh, passes. Um, the, 
you know, the method is called adaptive, adaptive quorum biasing, and it's too complex to explain and to, uh, and to scale. Therefore, we decided to take the Polkadot governance structure and adapt it once again, and using actually the uh, the voting structure that we created ourselves for the Bundeskunsthalle, uh, our quadratic voting app, which Hito has explained before. Um, so, yeah, here we created a very basic diagram modeled after uh, the Polkadot one, but uh, tweaked because, you know, no uh, out of the block, uh, out of the box uh, blockchain governance model can be adapted to the real world. Uh, so basically, we start from the assumption that there are stakeholders, um, as in the blockchain governance structures, and who are the, st the stakeholders for the Bundeskunsthalle? It's all of us. If you're paying taxes in Germany, then you are a stakeholder. A stakeholder in blockchain is actually someone that holds tokens, and your way of holding tokens uh, in an institution like this one is actually to just pay taxes. Um, so, simply put, um, the public of Bundeskunsthalle, so, you know, all the taxpayers, given they can be organized, and Germany has a really good history on self organizing around interest groups and EVAOs uh, and cooperatives that have even, you know, launched large businesses. So then we're not going to try to explain that. Uh, we're just going to leave it to imagination. Um, the public should elect a council, uh, which uh, Beth will uh, delve deeper in, and both the council and the public can make proposals. The proposals um, then are voted, uh, the public proposals are then voted quadratically to decide which one of the proposals is going to pass to public referenda. And the, council's pro the council proposals are passed directly and uh, after a review by the Bundeskunsthalle because. Um, Again, we need specialized people that are guiding these proposals. It's not that you can write a proposal on the back of a napkin and send it to the Bundeskunsthalle and it's going to be voted, because that's not how life works. Um, <laughs> and then uh, after the review, there will be another uh, public referenda in the, uh, with the combination of proposals from the council and from the public uh, that would be voted, again, uh, using quadratic voting or preference voting, as it's uh, also widely known and this is where the cool thing comes in so I said before that stakeholders is everyone that pays taxes and some are able to self-organize and some are also public servants I some are uh, working for the Bundeskunsthalle as uh, we said you know uh, subcontracted as well so but everyone should have a vote here um, if you pay taxes you should have a vote uh, in this public referenda so not only the public and the council uh, should vote but also the janitors the security personnel um, Oliver Kolia here uh, and everyone else from the organigram so what we're proposing here is a full inclusion uh, you know system that's able to uh, alternate between, you know, regular programming and operations from the Bundeskunsthalle, which we want to let be and conduct operations as uh, intended. Um, I know they do, they also done wonderful work in, you know, pushing transparency forward after certain episodes. So, you know, there's, you know, I we don't want to replace any of that. We just want to include the people here. Um, and of course, you know, uh, there's always, there always needs to be some kind of red button. So we included two veto uh, power per quarter for the Bundeskunsthalle in case, you know, we fall again into tyranny of structurelessness. And yeah, that's uh, basically our proposal. Um, yeah, so just going through an example of uh, how this looks like um, in practice. Uh, so um, in this diagram, we take this uh, extrapolation further with uh, examples using the crypt uh, pr cryptographic archetypes of Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Um, so uh, for our characters, we have Bob, a uh, Mexican artist living in Berlin who seeks appro approval for Bundeskunsthalle for a program encouraging newcomers to Germany to um, 
include their work in uh, like a program. Um, and he's joined by Charlie, a Rostock-based writer and um, po uh, podcast hostess proposing that Bundeskunsthalle extend its free admission policy all the way up to age 45. Um, <laughs> so uh, using our proposal process, Bob and Charlie would share their uh, proposals on a public forum moderated by Alice, the head of proposals. Uh, Alice fulfills the duties of head of proposals, which is expanded from the existing one that um, you guys also have um, uh, by ensuring proposals are clear in objectives, budget and labor requirements, timelines and how they advance the mission of the organization and any other information pertinent to informed decision making by the public. Alice would also provide clear documentation, instructions and hand on support to applicants as well as keep discussion civil and goal oriented in the forum and enact processes about how to move proposals forward to voting and execution. Um, so uh, moving through that discussion phase to a voting phase, we drew on a process common in DAOs in which um, if proposers uh, sufficiently engage with questions about the proposals in this public forum um, for a prescribed period of time and answer those questions in a sufficient way that um, people feel comfortable um, making an informed decision about them, uh, the proposals become eligible to um, start moving through to execution. So I guess down in uh, this section, <laughs> um, after Bob and Charlie fielded questions over a two week span on the pro their proposals viability and their commitment to making them happen, both proposals were included in a quadratic voting. Um, batch um, using the process uh, introduced by Hito. Um, during the quadratic voting phase, the preference uh, ended up lying with Bob's proposal um, because I don't know if it could continue functioning here if there uh, was removing that much um, admissions fees. Um, so uh, yeah, the German newcomer program ended up winning. Um, in that case, the selection sparks the next phase in which Alice and a council of experts um, work with her to shape their proposal or work with both of them to shape their proposal to make sure it meets the conditions and desires of um, the organization and Bob and the taxpayers being served. So then the proposal is able to pass the public referendum and begin executing. So, <laughs> so to, to our conclusion then. One, uh, it makes sense to allow a wider group of people to propose projects, events, and other um, suitable options simply because it's, um, it's an institution that exists within society. A structure like this would open up for a wider and potentially also more accurate um, uh, representation within, within the institution. As explained earlier, it would include not just the public, but also the staff who's working for the Bundeskunsthalle. The Bundeskunsthalle might be a government organization, but ultimately government works for the people. So number two, on-chain governance can be stalled. On every on-chain governance model, even those that are put into um, practice, like the one that we've used as an example, there are instances of mediation. And mediation opens up for collusion and also stalling. We believe that relying solely on technology doesn't necessarily create new models, but it actually creates heavier, kind of recreates the heavy system, but on the chain. Um, so by including people and advocating for a mix of established knowledge and new technology, we believe that decision making uh, might happen in a quicker and more accurate manner. Three, complete disintermediation or a complete rejection of the middleman um, doesn't happen within the DAOs, even though they kind of say that it does. Um, Complete dis uh, disintermediation just brings us back to what's already happening and in worst case, it might create even worse scenarios for us. Because of this, we believe that we still need to have the middleman in the system, um, but by adding our proposed flow and system, we basically streamline the power and the decision making. And number four, expertise and knowledge cannot and definitely should not be completely replaced by on-chain voting, not even quadrat quadratic voting. Expertise and knowledge matter. It really offers guidance and also adds incredibly lots of value for institutions such as the Bundeskunsthalle. Um, 
technology can offer support in the, in the decision making, but people and the staff um, cannot and should not be totally replaced by it. So basically what we propose is a hybrid in which the staff, the experts, the public and the system is supported by a protocol which further helps to open up for wider participation of the Bundeskunsthalle. Um, if you want to read more about the use of cases that we have presented, um, this is not the best way of sharing them, but we are of course happy to share them with you after as well. All right, um, we hope our presentation has been helpful and able to contribute new ideas on how to use technology for inclusion. Finally, while we have been working towards this day for a year, like Hito said, we gathered today under strenuous circumstances in very dark times. We could not be up here promoting more open systems while pretending everything's okay. So we prepared a list of verified uh, donation resources towards humanitarian aid. So please consider helping whether through crypto, you have three ways uh, and three cryptos to donate uh, with or euro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank, Department of Decentralization. Um, Thank you very much, yeah, Department of Decentralization. The war, Russia's war on Ukraine, um, has been called the first major crypto war. In, in history, which is uh, another reason, a good reason to talk more about blockchain than, than, than ever, because both uh, parties uh, use blockchain technology in this conflict, Russia, in order to, to circumvent um, sanctions, and you, the Ukraine has received enormous donations through blockchain donors. Now, I think we should move on quickly to the last presentation um, so that we can keep everything fresh in our memories. So so I would like to ask the other internet team to uh, give their presentation. Um, hello? Uh, yeah, thank you, Hito, for inviting us and um, to this wonderful institution. Uh, so uh, I'm Toby, and this is Sam and Laura. We're from Other Internet, which is an applied research organization. Uh, and what we do is we study uh, the phenomena of life and society under this digital condition, and we build social technologies that uh, help create more equitable systems. Uh, currently, we are developing uh, governance experiments and techniques in decentralized financial protocols, and um, another initiative is studying the uh, decision-making procedures of hyperlocal governance communities. And we have about 25 members, um, ranging from full-time researchers to advisors to contributors uh, from all sorts of multidisciplinary backgrounds. Um, and within other internet, the three of us are best known for our essays and uh, research publications and, and memes around the social aspects of the blockchain space, uh, including subculture formation, branding, and most recently, public goods, which we're concerned with today. So uh, as we discussed in our recent essay on this topic, uh, public goods uh, or blockchains can be considered public goods in view of their open source and non-excludable nature. Uh, but we felt that this definition has done more to justify self-serving activities on, uh, that benefit uh, cryptocurrency holders than the term public good would suggest. So we wanted to counter this empty definition and advocate for a more expansive view uh, informed by historical notions of the public and the good. And we arrived at the idea of positive externalities, a definition that would make others benefit axiomatic to what public goods are. Uh, for instance, uh, instead of the destructive scaling effects of something like Web2 platforms, uh, we argued that uh, greater scale should mean greater good valued by an increasingly wider set of people. Uh, and we think that this is a good design prompt for public institutions. Um, how can they achieve greater good as they scale? 
Uh, and we think that this, this design prompt applies to legacy institutions and traditional uh, cultural institutions as well, uh, such as the Bundeskunsthalle. Um, so how, how might that apply? Well, one issue that we see is that while currently public museums finances are, on, are part of the public record, very few people can actually interact with or access that information. And this has led in the past, um, not only with this institution, but many others, to unfortunate cases where uh, public uh, finance is actually used for the benefit of, of private actors, business interests, or, or self-interest. Um, and uh, so, so like self-serving crypto public goods, uh, public finance uh, runs the risk of being privatized. Um, so how might we solve this in the context of a, of a public institution like the Bundeskunsthalle? So our solution goes beyond public accountability um, to introduce a transparency device uh, using a public blockchain to make financial information accessible among a wider set of stakeholders, including artists, art audiences, art workers, and peer institutions. Uh, we propose using the squatted ENS domain, bundeskunsthal.eth, as the basis for a public record of transactions related to a chosen exhibition. Uh, the institution could then incorporate this financial ledger into curatorial materials such as exhibition catalogs or wall text. Uh, now a bit of technical background. ENS, or the Ethereum name service, makes it possible to assign domain names to public block blockchain addresses held by specific entities. For instance, the Bundeskunsthalle could designate artist, curator, and art handler as significant actors in this example exhibition's financials. In this case, funds sent to artist.bundeskunsthalle.eth would be directed to an address only accessible to the artist themselves. ENS works much like DNS, the domain name system we use every day. DNS is the phone book of the internet, a system that translates domain names like bundeskunsthalle.de to numerical IP addresses corresponding to distinct machines, 185-64-112-147. With IP addresses, browsers can then locate and fetch internet resources. In ENS, phone numbers become bank accounts. Notably, DNS addresses are also hierarchical. For example, tickets.bundeskunsthalle.de um, here, each level of the, of the namespace, subdomain, domain, top-level domain, is managed by the one above. Thus, the ENS domain, bundeskunsthal.eth, held by the museum, uh, could create and manage subdomains, pointing them to payable addresses in the control of independent parties. Uh, now a word on our proposed governance model for bundeskunsthal.eth. Uh, so, while there are many interesting blockchain experiments uh, and, and technologies to choose from, our, our, uh, our proposal opts for a simple, practical administrative mechanism, uh, a multi-signature wallet held by museum employees, in this case a two of three. The institution can easily incorporate this technology into their existing operational processes without complex legal arrangements with decentralized actors. Though centrally administered, the transparency of this multi-sig allows the museum to invite audiences to participate in soft governance of specific art economies by coupling the viewing experience with a public evaluation of financial accountability. So let's have a look now at how um, these systems can be used in practice to map uh, Bundeskunsthalle's value flows uh, in the case in which all transactions would happen on chain. 
So this diagram is, a, um, in, is an example depicting a simplified uh, art event uh, in which uh, payments, uh, uh, with payments to key entities, artists, participants. So as you can see, uh, Bundesconsole.eth uh, um, would send uh, um, the fees to the artist's uh, subdomain. Their account uh, would then use those funds uh, to purchase uh, travel, accommodation, material, and anything that's required uh, to um, uh, carry on the, like, to realize uh, the event, uh, and then um, it would send the remainder to um, the artist, uh, to each of the artist's addresses. So with this system, the entire value chain is transparent uh, for everyone to audit. And for institutions uh, looking to decentralize, uh, uh, such transparent financial accounting uh, can be quite intimidating. But um, we've seen in blockchain-based organizations uh, that transparent finance uh, can create new standards for shareholder accountability. In addition to these, uh, public decision-making over funds allocation and greater community engagements are two further trends in this emerging paradigm. So we expect a similar effect uh, among arts institutions, uh, where curation of value exchange uh, can begin a friendly, positive-sum competition among cultural institutions uh, to connect in deeper ways uh, with their own communities. So what would, this, what would it look like uh, for Bundesconsale.eth uh, to compete uh, against Centre-Pompidou.eth uh, or NewMuseum.eth uh, to provide better working conditions uh, for their artists and art workers uh, and deploy funds in a way that benefit uh, their own constituencies. Museums uh, who make their own financial flows not only public but subject to design uh, will be able to attract uh, a more engaged and enthusiastic public. Sorry. So, to conclude, uh, we believe that curation of financial flows uh, as a medium in itself uh, can bring art uh, closer to its network uh, of local stakeholders uh, and cultivate substantive relations uh, with those communities. Through this system, we can move uh, from an exhaustive form of institutional critique uh, with the museum as a target uh, to uh, the museum as a medium itself uh, for infrastructural critique uh, in the terms of theories Marina B. Schmidt, where infrastructure is understood uh, as a locus of social relations that extend beyond the institution itself. This is an institutional model in which public influence on finance itself is a direct outcome, which is made manifest uh, through direct uh, cash transfers and solicitation of artworks and projects uh, that benefit those involved. This kind of socially transmissible pattern of behavior is one of the ways uh, we believe uh, positive externalities uh, can be created. In this case, uh, Bundeskustale's adoption of value exchange curation may act as a public good uh, in itself uh, by catalyzing positive sum art worlds. And now, to add uh, to the resources that the Department of Decentralization shared, uh, we wanted to um, share another uh, another possible link. Uh, um, this is an uh, initiative that is developed by Gitcoin, uh, who is one of the projects that has uh, uh, cultivated quadratic voting uh, uh, within the blockchain space uh, um, in uh, um, partnership with Unchained Fund uh, to uh, raise funds towards humanitarian, towards a UK, re, Ukrainian humanitarian relief. Um, and so, yeah, we encourage also um, anyone to uh, participate in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank. Das ist die dritte Veranstaltung Thank you very much. This is the third event as part of our Exchange Value Series in which we are talking about blockchain and how value creation and things like that are changing. Uh, we've had the director um, from uh, the Uffizi Gallery here. Um, we had uh, uh, musicians and also artists, um, including the artist who was the first to sell an NFT to a public museum. But I think we haven't really explained or understood how the blockchain really works and what we can do with it. And tonight is a chance to do just that because blockchain governance 
ins Auge um, schaut, is something that is looking und, uh, straight in the eye of institutional governance and we can compare them and see what do they have in common, what can we do with one thing and maybe not another. But I would like to hand over back to Hito. I think we should now um, have a couple of uh, questions from the audience. I was asking for audience questions and contributions because most probably either our prototype didn't work, which is well possible, or um, also there's certainly questions in relation to the content of the presentations. Hier in der Mitte steht ein Mikrofon. We have a mic right here at the center. Yes, there is a question. Maybe you want to walk up to the microphone. And yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for all the uh, suggestions. And I have a question uh, for the Department of Decentralization. Um, I found uh, your suggestions very, very interesting, uh, uh, intriguing Screen for uh, the Bundeskunsthalle, and uh, I am one of the curators of the Bundeskunsthalle. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, wondering, um, so if one of the proposals comes through, so uh, it uh, gets voted for it, how do uh, financial realities and those proposals meet? So, for example, if for example, the proposal to have free entrance for, uh, I don't know, visitors under the age of uh, 45. This is uh, also a financial issue, and I, I think that Olive, also Olivia Hölken, uh, that immediately when this came to your ears, <laughs> that same thing maybe came to your mind. Um, how is uh, the funding, uh, um, yeah, organized? How can that? Um, how can we make it happen if a vote uh, comes through? Right. Thank you for your question. And uh, that particular example was uh, meant to, uh, you know, cause a little bit of commotion. Um, we understand uh, that a Bundeskunsthalle needs funding and needs to charge entrance. But, uh, you know, there might be the case that these proposals actually show up. And because, you know, we're not expecting the public to, you know, know the ins and outs of, fi uh, of finances in an institution so complex as the Bundeskunsthalle, there's, uh, we have created this role of the mediator of or Alice, who would actually work for the Bundeskunsthalle and uh, help the, uh, the public, uh, you know, get awareness over these complex topics. And uh, then after the review together, you know, with Alice and, you know, this, you know, in this case, Charlie, then, you know, a proposal might reach a middle ground on which, you know, only Wednesdays um, would, you know, this possibility be open for everyone. Or, you know, it might, you know, it might not hold and might not uh, be submitted to public referendum. Another thing is uh, obviously about the program. Um, uh, in this way, uh, also if you saw the first diagram, we have preserved the Bundeskunsthalle as it is. Uh, we're not expecting uh, the public to administrate the funds. Um, it's very complex. We've seen a uh, public administrating resources and treasuries in blockchain and failed horribly. I think that actually, and you know, after what other internet uh, proposed, you know, a sort of hybrid on which you know the organization Bundeskunsthalle would be able to implement a system like the one that they uh, they already presented. And then, you know, we would also have the proposal system that, you know, uh, also pushes for full inclusion of uh, all the stakeholders. Uh, that might be something that we, you know, we could work together towards achieving. Yeah. Okay, next Thank question, you. please. Can you hear yes. Me? Okay, perfect. We hear you. Um, I actually have two questions, um, and I'm just going to ask second one first, because I think the second one might take a second longer. And the first question is basically for the other internet. Um, you presented a lot about how the blockchain is working and how it opens up new possibilities of uh, controlling or like seeing what happened on the blockchain and having new instance of control where everyone can look in on the blockchain and everyone can, can see what is happening. But how does that differ in any way from what we're experiencing currently where a single government records 
a bunch of data, collects tax forms, and, in, and implements a new state, state of control. Because, of course, there's a new way of looking at it, but public records, for example, are open to the public as well. But there's no way we are enforcing them. So what you are presenting is a new way of looking at it, a new way of opening it up, but it makes no difference in the way that the state is going to run it or the state is going to organize it. So how is that, does your, prim, your basically your plan of implementing the blockchain into a new institution differ from any way that we are currently seeing it? How does, it, how does the blockchain open up new forms of control to the public that are not available currently? Um, well, I'm sure we all three have the slightly different answers to this great question, but um, one, one way to think about it is um, analogous to uh, social media. Um, social media allows uh, many people to uh, you know, coordinate and access information that is like, disseminated super widely and speak to each other about it. Uh, because it's there in like a digital form. And what we've seen from that is that it has become much easier for uh, the audience or the public of an institution to exercise a sort of control through voice over what that institution does. Um, you could see this when like airlines get um, a lot of flack. Like it's become common practice for airlines to be tagged on Twitter when like some sort of mishap happens and they've had to create large customer service departments to respond to those, those things. I think we imagine that um, dramatically increasing the transparency of these kinds of financial records and transactions uh, may have a similar effect where uh, public accountability becomes significantly more activated. Uh, it's a little hard to hear you. Can say that public accountability is something that has gotten more, like people may, may have gotten more aware of it. But for example, if you look at football clubs or like sports teams, especially in Germany here where we are living, for example, FTC Cologne has a lot of, had a lot of controversies even before the internet existed, where there was this public outrage and where people didn't buy tickets just because the, public, the team did some decisions. So there was always this kind of instancing. And it's not something new because the control instance that is being implemented, for example, for the Bundeskunsthalle, as for example, public curators, still have to be like kind of in, a, in the same situation. But you're just developing on it onto a system that is inherently uh, developed into the capitalistic system that is making it that is making it possible for something like NFTs and something like ultra capitalistic to exist in some sort of fashion. And I don't see how you, how you separate those two from each other, because the control instance could be could be developed under something in a completely different system, instead of using the blockchain for the same purpose that it has always been used in a public forum. You're, you're using the blockchain as like a new sort of public forum when it shouldn't be. The the monitor did not pick up most it's most of that. Difficult however, difficult to understand everything. But I think one of the gist of the question is: Do we need the block blockchain at all for a, for to create this kind of transparency? Could it be created otherwise? Right. And that's yeah. that's basically where I lead into my second question, which is: um, Isn't there in the name of department of decentralization some sort of hypocrisy? Because you're creating a department which is a centralized instance of something that should be decentralized which is you representing people, which are, should be decentralized in a centralized platform. In a city. Even if you have four people, you're still representing the people just as a representative mm. democracy is not always fair to all people. And that's something that is in your name inherently, like you were saying, you're speaking of de decentralization and using the blockchain as something that's decentralized, mm. which is still running only on like monolithic or like duopolitic markets. And yeah, basically. So, there was a lot in that, and we missed about three quarters of it. I'm going to speak. Um, I'm going to so I'll, I'll try to answer at least part of your question. Um, so, I mean, imagine an instance in which exhibition materials for this exhibition or one that's on outside uh, actually included the financial transactions that went to all of the individuals that were participating in that exhibition. Would you be and, a great step? Uh, please let me finish. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, th these are the materials that critics and, uh, you know, the wider public have access to. Uh, while the Bundeskunsthal does have their financials, you know, on, uh, you know online somewhere, 
I doubt that anyone in this audience has, has really dug into uh, any of those. So this is just kind of putting them front and center along with the curatorial materials. Uh, to your question, is the blockchain necessary for this? Um, I mean, it is, it is a symbolic device, and uh, it is a commitment um, to kind of storing that transparently. So uh, no, uh, it is not ex explicitly necessary. Uh, however, you know, the prompt for this, uh, for the event today, was to uh, kind of reimagine what the Bundeskunsthalle.eth uh, .eth domain could do uh, you know, for an institution like this. So this is our proposal of what to do with that domain. There was another question to the Department of Decentralization and let, I, I could barely hear it, but let me uh, try to um, re repeat it. Um, I think it was suggested that it is kind of hypocritical to refer to yourself as the Department of Decentralization. Also, I do think that a publicly traceable ledger with transactions locked and verified does need a blockchain. So far, and to my knowledge, is the only way that you have to make transparent transactions and you know keep them all under one ledger. So yes, the kind of financial flows that actually they suggest, they do need a blockchain. Um, and with regard of, uh, to our name, well, um, you know, blockchain and you know, alternative systems are built by people that communicate in many different ways, but actually memes is one of the ways that we communicate. Um, so our name is Ironic, and it's, it seeks to criticize actually the ironies with, you know, technocracy and, you know, it being, you know, questionably decentralized or not. So I think <laughs> Department of Decentralization exists very much within a flux. There are a few core people who's been here since the start, but depending on the project, there are people who are coming in, people who go. So like MP said, um, department by decentralization by all means, but we are really not a department. No. Mm -hmm. It's actually <laughs> illegal to have that name too. Um, it, we have another name, like a real name. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think weiter. that was the point of the whole presentation to state that decentralization, especially in the art context, is not necessarily productive but would lead just to some kind of populism, basically. And this is why the organigram was so complicated. In fact, it reminded me of, and this is why the discussion is interesting to me, to go forward maybe to governance models which I know from the 70s from contexts like workers' self-management in Yugoslavia, right, where also the janitors were able to um, vote or to have a say in the decisions of the company they were working in. So in that sense, I think these governmental experiments or experiments in governments, let's put it like that, um, also echo with historical proposals. And I think that's interesting, right? To take out the hype and the hyperbole of the block, block of many blockchain discussions, let's put it like that. And also to historicize and to apply them in a serious way, which uh, is void of, you know, this crypto stereotype hyperbole. Herr mm. um Mr. Hölken, uh, we just heard that we are not working on the blockchain, blockchain, blockchain today for several um, reasons, as, but blockchain is a good model, mental model to, to think about governance, new forms of governance. Now, from all the proposals that uh, we've, we've heard so far, have you heard anything that we can't do right now, that, uh, that we can't manage right now? Now, let's start with transparency. We're here in the Federal Republic of Germany, and I think this is a country that takes great care to monitor uh, spending public funds. We are not a country that is uh, known for being very corrupt. Uh, all public spending is scrutinized. Um, 
deutsche Bürokratie, uh, die auch manchmal... Uh, many, uh, at many levels, ist, and this leads to a lot of red tape and a lot of yeah. bureaucracy. This is what Germany is, is uh, famous for. Now, regarding the proposal made by other internet, now, if you can look at the blockchain model to um, visualize financial flows, um, I like to say that um, artists like Hito, for example, suddenly, um, you know, part of her private income is there for everybody to see. Well, but the, the tax the tax authorities they they already know um, how much I earn. Yeah, but but then this raises some data privacy issues as well. Um, and regarding the proposal from the Department of Decentralization, I think this it looks like a grassroots democracy. But uh, the funding of this institution, let me remind you again, is, is comes from tax, taxpayers' money. But people who participate in the vote, in the, in the voting to decide how this money is spent, this is only a small group of highly interested people in the arts world or from the arts scene who will even bother to vote. So the big silent majority who paid these taxes no longer has an influence on what's going to happen with those funds. And that's why I am a big fan of representative democracy, which, however, leads to very complex structures, governance structures, and which involves representatives of the public to decide what is going to happen to these public funds. Of course, collecting ideas um, through the blockchain process to um, to widen the scope a little bit is a good idea. But the decision on how the money is spent, I think we cannot uh, delegate this to kind of a grassroots system because that would exclude a large majority of taxpayers. That I stated, you know, that ultimately the you know the resource management uh, should be advised and, you know, come from Bundeskunsthalle. Mm. Und darf ich eine Frage anschließen? Ähm, ihr habt äh, diesen Rat entworfen. So you design this council that collects um, proposals, for example. But how is this council constituted? How is it, com how is it composed? What kind of people is it composed of? Who is a part of the council? Well, that's that's a really good question. Um, we thought about uh, you know detailing the council, but then you know we remembered again and what you said, Hito. You know, decentralized governance doesn't quite invent anything. Um, a, 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 you know, structures that are able to self-organize around interest groups have been existed and uh, they do very well, especially in Germany. Um, so you know, a proposed council could be you know stemming from these, uh, you know, interest groups and could be formed by, you know, a combination from artists, thinkers, uh, cultural workers, and, you know, you know, maybe also, you know, passers-by, you know, as long as, you know, there's some kind of um, structure that uh, allows them to, you know, vote these people in. Aber man müsste eine Wallet haben, ne? Also man müsste, you would be able, you would, would have to have a wallet to be able to to take part in negotiation on the blockchain. No, no uh, that's uh, that's the that's the thing, you know. Mm. Uh, Nine. I but by your taxes, you are a stakeholder, basically. Yeah. So there is no. Yeah. I inspired wallet, the model no on yeah. uh, on-chain governance, and you would need tokens for on-chain governance. But it's a model. It can be abstracted from the blockchain. Um, you can have it, like, for what it's worth, you can have a DAO uh, on a WhatsApp group. As long as you can get a transparent voting system, as long as you can get a public forum, you have a DAO. Um, that's, uh, you know, the, the thing about, you know, token holder vote, uh, weighted voting is that, you know, we use it for uh, our blockchains. But you know, the learnings and the structures can be taken uh, elsewhere as well. And this is what we propose. By all means, you don't need to get a wallet to participate on cultural decisions. Don't do that. Okay. Also, wir könnten quasi jeden Vorschlag auch ohne Blockchain
So each proposal could be implemented without the blockchain. No, but other internet, uh, that proposal, they insisted on it. Two other points which I found really interesting is first of all to think also of the sphere of financial transparency as a medium, basically as an aesthetic sphere, as a medium also for art production. That's something I find really interesting. I mean, apart from the obvious value of having flows, you know, being displayed in, in public. Um, but then again, I think, you know, going back to the case of this institution or many in which public-private partnerships produce some kind of corruption, frankly, uh, this wouldn't be really mitigated by putting everything on the blockchain because those operations, you know, of value transfer, of reputation washing and so on cannot really be quantified in these terms. But I think... Um, directing the interest and attention to financial networks as a whole, as a sort of infrastructure of art institutions, would almost necessarily create a discussion, you know, about how to describe those slippery operations, which cannot even be um, uh, clearly explained, you know, by economical theory as it stands. So I think that's a sort of side effect, you know, of, of this proposal, which I find really interesting, which is not basically targeting the core of it, but which arises as a consequence. Yeah, maybe, maybe just to address your, your critique also about personal privacy. Um, uh, clarification that our, our proposal is, is that uh, it would be used in an elective way. So the museum could shine a light on any kind of part of the economic flows you wish, uh, and that you could kind of designate entities, and those could be exhibitions, those could be departments within the institution, um, and uh, not necessarily individuals. Uh, although we showed, showed uh, some of our financials just as a, um, as a demonstration. But I think definitely, you know, any, any amount exceeding, I don't know, 20,000 euro or some such could be publicly on display. Why not? I mean, otherwise it's too cumbersome to account for all these more smaller amounts. But, you know, any of these larger donations specifically, I think it, there would be some public value in making these transparent mm. in an accessible way also, not buried somewhere in the files of Bundesrechnungshof. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we're a special case, we're uh, kind of a good use case for these experiments because we are um, really a perfect example of a central institution. We are a poor use case in the sense that we don't get any private donations, right? But which of these models would be best suited to prevent the scenario that a private collection is exhibited and benefits uh, from a public show and is later sold on for private profit? Okay, we can take a vote on this, right? Should we vote? The results, or at the preliminary results as they came in. Maybe we can switch back to the screen. Gibt es die Möglichkeit auch noch einmal Strike im Original zu sehen? Ja, das wollte ich gerade machen. Genau. So, could we see Strike in the original, maybe? Switch back to the website now. Um, we will see the original video, which is only around, I don't know, 18 seconds long. And this is its original state. Um, maybe we watch some more seconds. No, it's not. Well, no, there, there's not, it's not an action film, right? <laughs> there's just one single thing happening and I'm hitting the screen and that's it. And I chose it because it's very short and it has few stills and these could be distributed upon 100 people who were able to vote today. So you've seen it, there's not a lot to see. And the stills of this film or the order of these stills was now rearranged through the voting process, meaning that they represent, like in a representative democracy, again, um, the result of the votes. And I'll get to the result 
of the votes in a second, but we see that we got 40 seconds of votes, uh, of, of, of film, <laughs> which is now looking like a 70s flicker film, <laughs> Malcolm the Grease or something like that. <laughs> very, very nostalgic feel to it. Well, anyway. Uh, that's what it <laughs> Daran habt ihr ein Jahr gearbeitet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you worked on this for one year. Great. Is this, is this going to change as more votes come in? Longer. But anyway, so I want to show you what this really represents. We had a maximum of voting usable voting credits of 2,772. Uh, each one received 24. We had uh, 16 votes for the status quo, so that was that's the result. I tell you as it is. Ich hatte <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Then uh, DOD's proposal received 46 votes, 46 votes for the disintermediation proposal, and 42 votes for other internet and the suggestion to basically create a transparency device for public institutions. And let's say the uh, display form is this reorganization of the initial video work which you have seen. Now, I think, you know, the whole evening was uh, arranged as an experiment. What can you do with any kind of even virtual, even imaginary space of a Bundeskunsthalle, which would suddenly belong to you or not? What kind of even thought experiments uh, could, you, could you perform, which might hopefully re result in some kind of institutional transformation, which, as I said in the beginning, is definitely necessary, because too many art institutions are intri really intricately implicated into you know art washing fossil industries and which are feeding essentially war machines um, that that's the reality of it which we see very blatantly these days so institutional transformation is necessary of course you know experiments such as these can only start catalyzing a discussion of how to reorganize public institutions so that they serve the public good actually And probably, in order to do that, a redefinition of what the public good is will be necessary because I think for a long time we haven't talked about the public good at all in relation to art institutions, but you know, efficiency, uh, popularity, visitor numbers, whether they are profitable or not, these were the discussions held in the past, I don't know, more than 30 years when it came to public art institutions. So I truly hope that this evening was one tiny part of kickstarting that debate again of how not to have, you know, the public institutions, art institutions, which are, well, to some degree, an achievement uh, of this particular state of, and democracy of how not to let them go to rot and participate, uh, for example, in these kinds of fossil industry war machine corruption. And that can be only a tiny first step in kickstarting that debate again. I, I mean, I'm now just closing down. Kolja, would you like to say something? No? Um, I would say, if, if you are finished, I would thank no, you. I, mean, I would like to definitely thank everyone. I mean, first yeah. of all, you guys for opening up your institution for this kind of uh, democratic experimentation, even though it's speculative. I would like to thank other internet for really gracefully, you know, jumping up to the challenge and presenting what I think is also in artistic terms, uh, not only accounting terms, a very, very interesting and valuable proposal. And also DOD for bearing with me for almost a year now, you know, from one, uh, from one um, pushed um, date of event to the next, you know, with uh, 
um, finalizing this project. So many thanks to all of you and also to <laughs> many thanks to all of you with bear for bearing with us and our sometimes a bit technical explanations. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Ito. Danke, dass du die Bundeskunsthalle besetzt hast. Vielen Dank, Herr Hölken. Thank you very yes. much um, uh, for uh, squatting uh, our institution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oliver Hölken, for telling us about how Bundeskunsthalle is working right now. And thanks to um, our participants here for the great uh, work. So, Toby, Shorin, Sam Hart, Laura Botti. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Maria Paula Fernandez, Dina Gustafsson, and Beth McCarthy. The new work that was just created on the basis of the work Strike, which is part of the German governance uh, collection, which is not here, but uh, it is displayed here at a, uh, on a regular level. Uh, this uh, result is called Strike DAO, and uh, you will be able to see it at Bundeskunsthalle. And uh, on our website, you can find uh, all the previous episodes of uh, um, this uh, theme. And in the next couple of days, we will also make some input uh, from this conference here available. Running in the background. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. Tim Daubenschutz, the developer, and maybe Leah Filipovic for the design. <laughs> Right, this Tim Daubenschütz, uh, who values. developed the software. Die Bundeskunsthalle. That was it for today. The Bundeskunsthalle is uh, still a squat. And uh, thanks a lot for taking part in a vote on the future of Bundeskunsthalle. And uh, those who are right here with us are welcome to now have a drink with us. Thank you. Goodbye.